Have you checked the children? <laughs> days and pleasant nights fellow travelers along the path of the beam i'm known on this level of the towers high me and fuego and if it please you join me here for a bit of palaver on hail to stephen king that's right uh, this uh, beautiful tower of books that is just beside me here you can just call me fuego for short and i cordially welcome you to the horror show and uh, yes this once uh, weekly program where we talk all things El Rey, as I so affectionately call him, and this is the second part in a uh, Trapped with Stephen King special. Who else is a bit stir-crazy in the midst of all the zaniness? I know that I'm sure getting there, man. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's been uh, officially just over a week now since, uh, yeah, the the day job at least that provides like a larger chunk of the income compared to everything else as far as the journalistic variety goes and uh yeah that uh you know basically just disappearing suddenly and just being here at uh, casa en fuego uh, my lady is working from home it's been uh, yeah it's been an interesting time but uh, i am here to fulfill my second half of the bargain that i had mentioned last week it was originally going to be a dolores claiborne review anniversary 25 years all that coolness but uh yes that is going to actually be shelved at least for the time being because of the fact that i did not want to relent on this so First and foremost, a shout out to my homie Malito Pietro, who is over in Italia and uh, just really weathering some crazy storms over there. And uh, much love to you, my good friend. And uh, you mentioned in the comments what I forgot to last week. That's right. So even though this is supposed to be all about shorter tales, like, you know, shorts and some novellas and maybe some television work, stuff like that. But obviously, how could you mention uh, just feeling trapped as a Stephen King fan in a particular story without Under the Dome. I probably forgot to mention it in my notes here because of the fact that I don't really like Under the Dome very much, and I have gone on record to mention that many, many times. So, uh, once again, I know it's the Rod Rodney Dangerfield situation there, and like, yeah, I don't get too much respect when it comes to Under the Dome, you know? I'm not the biggest fan of it. However, um, you know, Barbie and the entire crew there, you know, uh, you know, Big Jim and so on and so forth, it's it's an interesting story, you know? It's uh, very much a just, you know, trapped in a small town, like kind of bunker mentality sort of situation as opposed to a uh, little bit more of an interesting scenario. And uh, I, I mean, really, I almost did a video uh, this month about the cannibals, which is the 60 something page treatment that initially was, uh, you know, where King used as a springboard when he was trying to rewrite Under the Dome. And so that's that's something that you can check out if you want to go to Stephen King's website. He actually has that first, like, 50, almost 60 pages of The Cannibals, which is essentially about a bunch of people trapped in an apartment building and they can't get out. And uh, hence the title, what do you think they're going to do? Yeah, uh, that's probably going to be an upcoming video dependent upon how long self quarantining and social distancing and everybody just being you know stowed away in their homes uh you know thankfully i have you know savings and other work to do and a you know awesome partner in catherine and so you know that's just something to keep in mind but nonetheless it's a time for people to be creative in not just how they're attempting to you know make money with their skills but you know also just to I, I guess pour some fuel on the proverbial fire, but yeah, I, I mean proverbial fire. I mean under the dome, man. It entails, uh, you know, the, basically like half of a fishbowl going down on you know Chester's Mill in Maine. And I talked extensively about this story for its anniversary recently, so I'm not going to go into any extreme lengths or anything. But um, yeah, and not a personal favorite of mine. The whole the whole resolution for why things transpire doesn't really jive with me, but I mean, especially when you're talking initially all of the repercussions of the dome coming down and everybody initially becoming trapped, so to speak, the woodchuck getting sliced in half, planes, helicopters, you know, flying into an invisible barrier, all that stuff is dope. Everything else, eh, I'm not so fond of, but let's get into the stories properly today. So 
Uh, before I launch into all of my favorite novella and short story just instances of Stephen King making you feel a little bit trapped, I have to say one phrase. Give me what I want and I'll go away. That's Storm of the Century, man. Storm of the Century, which was uh, Stephen King basically writing a novel for TV, as he called it, uh, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the script is right there on the shelf in hardcover edition, obviously. But I mean, imagine if you are in the midst of a nasty snowstorm and you're trapped with this guy who very well could be the devil, who was like, just give me one of your children and I'll leave and, you know, the storm will subside, everything will be okay. That's essentially just the setup for this really crazy and, in my estimation, underappreciated and uh, really, uh, I mean, just underloved. It, it was seen by enough of a quotient of people, but it was at that time when Stephen King was really just losing kind of some of his mojo, not creatively necessarily, but definitely as far as like, you know, the mainstream appreciation and so on. He had his resurgence a couple of years ago when I started this program, but yeah, man, I, I mean, as far as uh, just, man, under, uh, you know, just loved and appreciated, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, this that's definitely one that needs its distinction and needs its attention because it's really messed up, especially the finale, <laughs> oh boy. It is, uh, it is uh, relatively messed up. And then even in Rose Red and Kingdom Hospital, uh, which also came out around the same time, Rose Red shortly after, and then Kingdom Hospital, which was a reimagining of the Lars von Trier, which if you guys haven't seen The House of the Jack Bell, <laughs> Matt Dillon, we just watched that this past week, and it's messed up. It's not really, it's, it's uh, basically if, uh, you know, you pizza when you're supposed to french fry or vice versa, whatever that South Park reference is, you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, the House of Jack Belt's not gonna leave you very happy necessarily, but it's a poignant film, that's for damn sure. But uh, so Kingdom Hospital was Stephen King's reimagining of uh, Trier's uh, Dutch uh, series, The Kingdom, and then also Rose Red being kind of a hodgepodge of sorts of like uh, stories about the Winchester Mansion and then also, uh, you know, some of uh, Shirley Jackson's, uh, you know, uh, Taunting Hell House and stuff. But uh, yeah, both of those are also trapped in a specific area sort of situations, one with paranormal investigators and then another one in a hospital where, you know, there's everything from, you know, seismic earthquakes and craziness transpiring to various, various other things, but still being trapped within the confines. And so I just felt the need to mention all three of those, although personal just preference is most definitely Storm of the Century. Um, yeah, as far as, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know, uh, something that uh, needs to be seen by more, even read by more. The script is great and actually uh, shed some additional light on certain characters and situations and motivations and stuff like that. So definitely check it out. But uh, now I am going into a full on, basically uh, just, you know, lightning round of sorts here, talking about some of the most scary situations that, uh, you know, short stories uh, of Stephen King have uh, brought us. But just to recap the previous half, we have Carrie trapped in a burning gym. We have The Shining trapped in a haunted hotel in winter with a psychopathic father. Uh, we also had Cujo trapped in a car with a rabid dog outside. We had Misery trapped in the remote home as hostage of your number one fan. Also see Lisey's story, we talked about that. The Tommydockers trapped in a town as only one who is under an alien, uh, only one who is not under an alien spacecraft's control. Uh, Gerald's game trapped chained to a bed alone in a remote cabin. Also, the dark half trapped with your evil alter ego and forced to write, and that does tie in with a few other things as well, most notably the aforementioned misery. Uh, the Green Mile, Shawshank Redemption, also The Outsider, Rise of the Dragon. I mean, we're talking about the scariness of being trapped in a prison for a crime you didn't commit. Also, Desperation, trapped in a deserted town, besieged by a body-jumping evil entity known as Tack. Shout out to Johnny C, who just recently read that. The, the Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, trapped as a lost youth in the woods while stalked by a crazed creature that you cannot identify. Then you've got Dreamcatcher and Song of Susanna. Shout out to all of you Tower Junkies for trapped as a prisoner in your mind 
with someone else having taken over your body. Then from a Buick 8, you're trapped, uh, you know, in a feeling of working for decades in the presence of a vehicle that is an unkillable evil. And uh, yes, uh, you really need to understand the context of that one to really, you know, get the just full aspect of it and then sell. Uh, specifically for me, the most unnerving situation was when you're trapped at a college that is besieged by rage zombies. Gave the do to Under the Dome. So anyway, uh, Sleeping Beauty is trapped in a world that is suddenly without women. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine the average man going absolutely bonkers about that. And then lastly, Stranger Things, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Institute, uh, trapped as experimental government test subjects. See also Firestarter. And then there was, you know, just a few uh, minor mentions about slow mutants and the gunslinger trapped in various bodies and drawing of the three, trapped below Lud, and also trapped in Blaine the Pain in the Wastelands. And then we've also got uh, Sisters of Euluria, which is one of my favorite Dark Tower stories, man. Seek that out. It's super dope. It's imagine if you were wounded and trapped in basically a coven of uh, vampire nurses that are eventually going to drink you completely. And then if you were a breaker in Dark Tower 7, you know, you were trapped in Thunderclap at uh, Devar Twi, Twa, Twa, and I've never, never really got the proper pronunciation for that, but you were trying to break all those beams, man, and you were trying to do your thing. But now let's go to the proper lightning round and talk about some of St uh, Stephen King's shorter stories, l raised stuff that is a little more bite-sized and will still just kind of feed your needs of being trapped. And uh, if there's something that I forget here, well, sorry guys, I've been holed up in uh, Casa and Fuego for a while. I feel this is pretty thorough, but hey, I'm only human after all. Don't put your blame on me. So let's start out with Graveyard Shift. Graveyard Shift is essentially if you were just trying to clean out this like area below this mill and it is overrun with these crazy large rats. It was made into a uh, feature film that had Brad Dourif in it at one particular point. The, the film is not very good. I, it's late 80s, early 90s, I'm trying to remember, but it is of that era where Stephen King was kind of becoming a punchline. You know, he was kind of becoming a joke as far as mainstream people go. It's like we had seen so many terrific adaptations in the late 70s and early 80s, and this was where the cheese factor was coming in, but I still kind of feel that this one is underappreciated, at least from the short story standpoint, because, you know, college boy, Mr. You know, college, blah, blah, as the foreman constantly says to him, uh, this kid is trying to pick up extra hours uh, over the 4th of July weekend, and so he is below this mill trying to clean this area up that hasn't been attended to in years and years. And there is a nasty vermin problem, as I mentioned, Let's just say, since it's in Night Shift, and uh, it's one of those earlier Stephen King stories, there's no silver lining, and it does not end well. Uh, and check out the adaptation, you know, make up your own mind, as I, I will all too often say, but nonetheless, let us move on, since I have to go through all of these very, very quickly. Next up, we have another entry from Night Shift, and I don't like this story, but, you know, it is what it is. It's called Battleground, and Battleground is about this... Uh, this hired killer guy who has somebody deliver him a package that has all these little army men in it and they all proceed to try to kill him so he's trapped in his home with a bunch of just yeah it's like a, a bucket of army men like you used to see in like the you know post-world war ii era where all these kids wanted to yeah play with my my infantry and my little green guys and so on and so forth uh, it was made into a episode of Nightmares and Dreamscapes on TNT as directed by Brian Henson, no less. Uh, James Woods, if I recall correctly, too. But you can't help silly storytelling. And uh, it's one of my least favorite Stephen King short stories. It's just lame, I guess is the best way I can put it. But, I mean, there is uh, worse scenarios that we could find ourselves in. So let us move on. Next up is the short story uh, called Trucks. Uh, also uh, redubbed this Maximum Overdrive. How could I forget this, right? Uh, all the machines in the world start coming to life and you're uh, you know, held up in a diner, trapped there with a bunch of idiots and trying to make your way out. Um, 
The actual short story, you know, is uh, it's a lot darker and doesn't have just that cheese charm of the scenario that Stephen King brought to, uh, you know, as he said, I'm going to scare you half to death or whatever, you know, when he did that coked out promo for this film. Only film that Stephen King ever directed, Emilio Estevez, you've got Jordley Smith who voices Lisa Simpson. I mean, what a wacky cast of people in that film and the ACDC soundtrack. I mean, man, Maximum Overdrive is something else. And uh, it's, it's one that I've actually grown an affinity for over the years because it's just so utterly ridiculous. And I, I mean, the soda machine and, uh, you know, the baseball kids getting absolutely mutilated. It's, it's a messed up movie and yet it's, it's hammy and funny and stupid and embraces the silliness that, uh, you know, the, the short story keeps it a little more on the serious side. You know, there's cars that have come to life, you know, big 18 wheelers and stuff that are all outside and eh, it is what it is in that regard. But, uh, yes, the original short story, uh, it's serious in tone, Stephen King's lone directorial effort, not so much. So keep that in mind. Next up, we have another instance of Night Shift. And this is another one that kind of took a life of its own on. This is Children of the Corn. Imagine if you were trapped in a small town, remote, out in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska. Uh, I think it's Nebraska if I remember correctly. Meh, cornfields, whatever. But uh, just, I mean, you're in a town and all of the adults are gone. You're trapped there. You are the two only adults and you're just passing through and there's all of these murderous, cultish, uh, you know, nasty little kids, and they all want to uh, murder you. Yeah. Good times. It's a series that, uh, as I said, took on a life of its own with its immense amount of sequels. It's actually the most sequelized and uh, franchised Stephen King story ever. Seriously. Yeah. Between the remake, between the, I think they did six sequels and then they did a sequel to the remake. And then they also did a remake of the remake, which is Genesis. It, it was just, man, these are not good films. Although I do really hold the torch for the remake because of the fact that unlike the Linda Hamilton original film, it, uh, it retains the darkness of, uh, the short stories ending to a degree at least. Uh, but yeah, once again, it's Night Shift era at Stephen King. We're talking his mid-70s output. I think this story originally appeared in Playboy, if I'm not mistaken. And so it was very of the Twilight Zone, Outer Limits ilk, where it was all about the twist, messed up ending, no silver lining, no bright, shiny, you know, like grass on the other side. Nope, donuts, man. We're talking messed up stuff. You're trapped in a town where all of the kids want to kill you. That's a scary scenario. <laughs> Now we move on to what I would imagine is one of the most thought of in this particular instance as far as Stephen King stuff goes when you were trapped in a situation that you just can't get out of. And it's kind of a scaled down version even of what he expanded upon in Under the Dome, and that's The Mist. The Mist was originally in Dark Forces, and it's not a short story. It's really bordering on novella status and the fact that it's over 100 pages, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I mean, you're holed up in a grocery store after a bunch of stupid uh, governmental ingents from uh, the shop, if you guys are familiar with that, which is essentially the equivalent of the people who were doing experiments on Eleven and Stranger Things, if you're of the uninitiated variety. But uh, yeah, imagine if you are holed up in this grocery store after this, like, just portal, essentially, has been opened to a Lovecraftian alternate universe where crazed creatures have come over and have in turn just misted over the entirety of the town and besieged it with various monsters of all kinds of nasty varieties. That's essentially the mist. And it's really more so than the creature aspect though, the stir craziness, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, and the, the bunker mentality of people turning on each other factioning off in turn there's a just religious reich of nasty which this is one of the few Stephen King stories that I think is better in its filmed version from Frank Darabont it's uh it once again it expands upon stuff but <clears throat> it also um just man it's so nasty in its ending compared to just you know hanging out at the pseudo holiday inn you know with my son and you know yeah there's people still would listen, some of the died, blah, 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 whatever. Nobody has forgotten 
that Stephen King ending with Thomas Jane and his son, and uh, you know being Darabont and the fact that he worked on The Walking Dead. You've got uh, actresses that play Carol and Dale, and, and, and I mean it's it's a damn good movie. It is, uh, for my estimation, the best Stephen King adaptation. Yeah, sorry, Shawshank. Moving right along, we come to my favorite segment in Creepshow from both movies. Yeah, we're talking about The Raft, man. I still remember watching The Raft from Creepshow 2 as a kid, and yes, the beautiful bazoombies of that girl was one thing, but what happens shortly thereafter, this creepo, like, takes her shirt off while she's sleeping on the raft, will also haunt my memories forever. Because this is some of the most gruesome practical that I've ever seen. Essentially, you're out in, uh, in this case, uh, Arizona, up north, like right around Prescott, if I'm not mistaken, and you're like, oh, it says no swimming in this lake, whatever, let's just swim out to that uh, raft, which is essentially like one of those little wooden dock things like in the middle of the lake. They go, they swim out there, and lo and behold, there is an oil slick that is essentially the equivalent of the blob. And upon any sort of interaction with it, it in turn eats you in a gruesome, disgustipated fashion. And yes, Creepshow 2, I mean, it looks basically like a black tarp that is floating on, you know, the water. But the, the gruesome after effects of what this this thing does to people. I mean, suspension of disbelief. You have to remember, I was like six or seven when I saw this initially, and it still haunts my dreams to this day. It is so disgusting. The short story is very good, though, I must admit. Although it's weird that the 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 oil slick has this weird, like, hypnotic aspect to it, you know, in the short story, which is good, but also, just like with the mist, and, uh, the mist, the mist, an instance where um, I feel like the adaptation was a little bit better, especially the ending. The ending is so satisfying for this, you know, with this schmucky dude and uh, with his aforementioned, like, trying to check out the girl's goodies and stuff. He kind of gets what he deserved, maybe tenfold, but, you know, hey, it is what it is. Creepshow 2 has a couple forgettable segments, and then it has the raft. Damn, is it good. Moving right along, uh, and I have obviously taken way too much time on a few of these, but uh, the Beach World is another one from uh, the same collection as the, you know, the raft. It's a uh, skeleton crew, if I'm not mistaken, which is right up there. Uh, this is more of a sci-fi sort of story. It's about these guys that are suddenly uh, in a futuristic scenario, trapped on this planet that is essentially like a desert planet. And there is some, some backstabbing that goes down and, uh, you know, just like survival mode. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, in any event, uh, let us move it on to uh, also Survivor Type is another one here that I have to mention that I believe is also uh, collected in Skeleton Crew. Imagine if, as opposed to being trapped on a, you know, otherworldly, you know, desert planet, dune status or whatever, Frank Herbert shout out. Uh, we're talking about you are alone uh, on a deserted island, everybody else is dead, your plane crashed, and uh, I'm trying to remember if it was a plane crash or a shipwreck and uh, he's there, but lo and behold, none of that matters. You are essentially trapped on a deserted island with nothing to eat except yourself. And lo and behold, this guy is a surgeon, so he just starts cutting like a surgeon, cutting for the very first time, and he starts eating himself. And uh, this was originally going to be an episode of season one of the Creepshow television series on Shudder, but lo and behold, they determined that the practical to just bring this to life was going to be a little more costly. Now that they have a hit on their hands and they've been renewed for a second season, maybe we do finally see Survivor type. But yes, scenario, eat yourself. Eh, I guess if you don't really have any other options, just grody, yodi. But uh, next up, we have Grandma. Grandma. Yeah. Uh, this is a short story about a kid who feels trapped within his own home because he is trapped with his could be kind of a witch grandmother as his uh, as his actual mother goes to run some errands and stuff like that. It was actually adapted into a feature film, really stretching the plot and actually turning your villain into something completely different. It was called Mercy. It had Carl from The Walking Dead in it. 
it was not very good. I reviewed it here on the channel, but uh, there was also an uh, episode, uh, if I'm not mistaken, of, um, oh goodness, uh, George Romero's uh, anthology show, uh, the Tales from the Dark Side. There was an episode of Grandma about the fact that this kid is just, he feels so trapped and frightened at the fact that he is just a deteriorating grandmother's presence is, uh, you know, she's trying to like jump her soul into his body. It's a crazy story, but to be an imaginative child and wonder if that's actually happening or not, yeah, that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Now we go into one that probably, if I was going to narrow down shorts, novellas, and actual lengthy novella, uh, actual like novels, like full-fledged stories, into a just proper list, The Langoliers from Four Past Midnight would probably be a part of that. So let's say you're on an airplane flight. Very few are right now because of the fact that, uh, yeah, you're all scared of the uh, virus 19, as I'm calling it, so as not to get this video demonetized. But um, yeah, isn't that... Isn't that so crazy? The Stand and Captain Trips, 19 is the Stephen King number. It's what we're dealing with. I just, I, I don't know, man. <sighs> Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Anyway, um, so The Langoliers from Four Past Midnight is about if you're on a plane and you're sleeping during the plane flight, and when you wake up, everybody else from that particular flight, as you're actually like, you know, landing and everything, everybody else that was awake is gone. The only people left on the flight are all of those who are asleep. And so you get off the plane, you're at the airport, there's nobody at the airport. You're essentially in a completely abandoned and barren just reality, existence, world, whatever, and you are stuck there with this uh, blind child with foresight, and there's some, just all, all kinds of crazy characters within it, but uh, this weird patch of reality that you have found yourself in is being slowly eaten away by these proverbial Langoliers, and yes, I know they made them look really, really shitty with uh, the adaptation on ABC with the dude from Perfect Strangers, but nonetheless, the story is still frightening. You are trapped in an airport and like the clock is ticking man your time is running out because your reality that you have suddenly found yourself in is being chomped away by these like proverbial like eaters of existence it's it's a messed up concept and it's one of stephen king's best i this is one that with modern technology and better special effects i would champion them to remake i love the langoliers and uh yes that is definitely something to make mention of Next up, this is one that Catherine and I were talking about right before I started filming. We are talking the end of the whole mess. And if I'm not mistaken, this was collected in Nightmares and Dreamscapes, which is it's my least favorite Stephen King uh, just collection of stories, unfortunately. It's, it's really between that and uh, uh, probably everything's eventual as far as... Not that there isn't good stories in there, but there's just a lot that I'm not supremely fond of. But, I mean... The end of the whole mess is essentially about this older brother who was telling the story about his younger prodigy brother who, you know, he becomes this, like, worldwide phenomenon and, uh, you know, as far as just, you know, um, amazing scientific, you know, just invention and, uh, you know, the, just making the world better and, uh, you know, but what he actually pinpoints upon is the fact that there is a particular just mineral additive you know whatever the hell you want to describe it as uh, that is prevalent in this one town in texas and it's uh so prevalent in fact that it has made everybody there very docile there is no crime uh there's um, there's been no arrests for like who knows how goddamn long and so what he decides to do is unleash this uh you know like bit of uh stuff upon the entire earth and he doesn't necessarily understand the consequences of putting this into a uh, about to erupt volcano and the fact that, oh, could that in turn make us just not cognizant and lose our sense of self and so on. And I mean, it was uh, adapted uh, also for TNT's Nightmares and Dreamscapes. It's one of the best stories on there along with Crouch End with Claire Ferlani. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's essentially told from that perspective of a guy who 
just he knows that his mind is slipping away. And uh, while I really liked the adaptation that was done for TNT, the bottom line, his brother's overzealousness kind of doomed the entire human race, which is a scary sort of thing. And I realize that I've been going for about 30 minutes at this particular point already, so I have to kind of speed up the proceedings. So uh, jumping to another one that's in Nightmares and Dreamscapes, we were talking, you know they got a hell of a band. And this is about a uh, couple that is traveling and find themselves in this town trapped with all of these different rock and roll icons. We're talking Janis Joplin, we're talking Morrison, we're talking uh, you know Hendrix, those are the big three that all died around the same time, but various others, uh, oh boy, Buddy Holly, I mean, so, so many that you know lost before their time and they are trapped in this particular place and uh, you know there is a daily concert that goes down and all this other stuff but uh, also adapted very well for Nightmares and Dreamscapes. It's kind of funny how you know uh, so many of these that I'm talking about right here are uh, with uh, with regards to that and uh, man I'm really gonna have to speed through these so uh, Home Delivery, uh, Rainy Season, those are two that I just have to plow through very very quickly. The uh, Rainy Season I, I recall very specifically as uh, this couple that is trapped in a home that, you know, they are meant for a uh, proverbial sacrifice of sorts and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, all these crazy murderous frogs get rained down. It's another one of those weird, like, psyching stories, um, you know, that it's okay, but once again, this is another Nightmares and Dreamscape story, just trapped in weirdness. I don't know, the King, after he got sober in the early 90s, it's a little more hit and miss for me as much as I absolutely adore El Rey. The home delivery is a zombie story, if I recall correctly. And uh, yeah, that's one where, you know, this this woman is, uh, you know, trapped on this small island in Maine and, you know, corpses start coming out of their graves and so on and so forth. That one I actually like a little bit better than, than uh, you know, rainy season. But the aforementioned Crouch End with Claire Frelawney, also from Nightmares and Dreamscapes, as I just told you guys. This one is about, uh, this is one of the most Lovecraftian psyching stories. So Crouch End is essentially a smaller suburb of London, uh, apparently, and uh, it's like a thinny. And so this thinny where this woman and her husband find themselves trapped in is like overlapping with some crazy reality that is uh, alternately filled with all kinds of creatures, demons, we're talking the mist status here. And uh, yeah, if you're feeling trapped in this town, like her husband, like he crosses over and then she can't find him because he can't come back over and she's trapped in this crazy town, freaking out, losing her mind. It's one of the best adaptations on Nightmares and Dreamscapes. In fact, all the ones that I'm recommending, you know, End of the Whole Mess, you know they got a hell of a band, Crouch End, uh, those are probably three of the absolute best from Nightmares and Dreamscapes, so check those out. Uh, the House on Maple Street, if I'm true, oh boy, this is one that I am uh, attempting to recall, and uh, if, oh boy, I may have to skip this one because it's another from Nightmares and Dreamscapes. If I'm not mistaken, this is the one where the kids are uh, trapped with the stepfather in the, the home that's kind of just adding rooms and almost like Winchester mansioning itself and it's got ascensions and it eventually like skyrockets up and you know into the heavens and you know they send it up with their evil stepfather and stuff yes that is definitely what it is it just takes a little bit of a minute in the early morning hours sometimes to get this point across so yeah that one is uh once again it's nightmares and dreamscapes i i love some of the stories but it's relatively lackluster in other varieties so you know Pardon to everybody who has an affinity for it. In the death room, now we are officially jumping into everything's eventual status. Um, in the death room is essentially one about this guy who pretends to be dead. He is trapped in a morgue in South America, if I recall correctly, and he he's basically acting as if he is dead. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, once again, Everything's eventual, not one of my absolute favorites as far as psyching stuff goes, but hey, it is what it is. Let's move on to one that I really, really dig, which is 1408. And 1408 was adapted by a uh, European director whose name eludes me, unfortunately, at this particular point when you have 
so many names, so many story concepts, all this different stuff. It's almost like the Kelly Bundy mentality where when you continue putting stuff in, eventually you do kind of, your brain is filled and it's gonna push factoids out. We don't necessarily want that, but yeah, John Cusack, Samuel L. Jackson, terrific adaptation about this guy who is a ghost hunter debunker. He basically goes into different allegedly haunted establishments, you know, hotels, homes, so on and so forth, and basically is there to disprove the aspect of the haunting. And unfortunately, with 1408, he gets far more than he bargained for by finally getting the real deal. Uh, it, the story is elevated significantly by Cusack's performance. Uh, this is another one where the adaptation, you know, Darabont status is actually better than the short itself, and uh, it's it's sad. It deals with the loss of a child and a few other factors that just will really tug on the heartstrings, man. So uh, that is uh, another one. Lunch at the Gotham Cafe. Let's say you and your uh, spouse are about to get those divorce papers finally signed, but lo and behold, there is a crazoid who holds all of you hostage at gunpoint and just starts massacring everybody in this classy New York restaurant. Yeah, trapped at uh, gunpoint with that sort of insanity. It's got some rage vibes to it, being the Bachman book. Uh, definitely has to be mentioned because it's very effective. It's very, very good. Next up, we have Riding the Bullet, which was originally published as an ebook. It broke the internet when it initially happened, but this is another one of those, it's got some Joyland vibes to it a little bit because of the fact that it's a late 60s period piece about this kid who was trying to hitchhike and, you know, make his way back to see his, uh, his sick mother, and lo and behold, he is picked up uh, by a driving corpse. It's kind of crazy. It's not... It's not the most, uh, you know, memorable Psy King short story or, uh, you know, film with David Arquette in it, but nonetheless, you get picked up by somebody as a hitchhiker and you are trapped in that car and you're just like, holy shnikes, what am I supposed to do? Is this guy gonna kill me? Something worse? I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's a, uh, it's... It's a Mick Garris, you know, so that will kind of give you the indication of quality as far as Psy King stuff goes. Bless your heart, Mick, you know, uh, yeah, you've uh, been responsible for some of the best and some of the worst Psy King adaptations. So what are we going to say there? Jumping now to Just After Sunset, uh, which is up there along with Night Shift as probably my favorite collection of Psy King short stories. And uh, we have Willow. Willa, for me, is the most romantic story that Stephen King has ever written, and if I was to tell you why, it would spoil the story. But essentially, imagine if you are displaced in the afterlife and you are stuck at a train station, and you are, unless you're willing to cross over the rest of the way, you are in this proverbial limbo. You are trapped. You are waiting for a train that is never going to come, and uh, just... This guy, he, he has to seek out his love who has gone to this uh, nearby country bar. And, uh, you know, it, it's essentially about him being willing to escape those confinements. And it's very cool. It's, uh, and oh boy, it hits me in the feels. It's, it's one of those psyching stories, everybody. As we are to our last few right now. So uh, next up, another one that myself and Catherine were talking about yesterday because she's been trying to figure out weird places to run with the gym closed and stuff. That's the gingerbread girl. The gingerbread girl is about this woman who is jogging along the beach. It's like her routine thing in, down in Florida. And lo and behold, some sick motherfucker decides to kidnap her. And uh, yeah, we're talking borderline every, you know, nastiness. Yes, let's just put it at that without spoiling the story. And it essentially becomes uh, her attempt to escape. And really, I, I might as well just at least knock out Big Driver at the same time, which is in um, <clears throat> uh, Full Dark No Stars, which is right down there. And that's one about this uh, woman who is an author who is in turn kidnapped and, you know, just abused and left for dead in this, like, huge storm drain pipe and stuff. But uh, in some ways, I feel like the Gingerbread Girl is better. I don't know. They're trying to make it into a feature film right now. They're going to have to do some expansion because it's there's really not much else that 
goes down beyond our main conflict. I mean, I guess you could probably squeeze like 75, 80 minutes out of that story, Gingerbread Girl. But um, in any event, uh, we go to our other trapped tale from just after sunset. This one's kind of gross. This is called A Very Tight Place. It's about these two older guys that are squabbling over property, and lo and behold, one locks the other one in a porta potty and proceeds to like flip the damn thing over and he is trapped in a, I mean if you're talking about trapped confined close quarters man I mean just in the disgusting aspect of all of that uh, like I don't think any hand sanitizer is going to help you out in that particular variety sorry for uh, you know uh, swab wipes or whatever that is some grossness that you will not get past uh, this is another one that I, I, I don't think they could make it into a feature. Uh, they could most definitely turn it into an anthology, uh, you know, installment or something like that, and I would really dig seeing it. But lo and behold, A Very Tight Place is one of, for me at least, the grossest Stephen King scenarios that I can even fathom. It's, it's terrible. Next up, we have the other two more trapped aspects of uh, Full Dark No Stars, and we have 1922, and we have A Good Marriage. 1922 is about just being trapped in this home where you are just overwrought with guilt, and your son, who was, uh, you know, your accomplice in the murder of your wife slash his mother, uh, has, you know, flown the coop, and he's run off with his little lady, Bonnie and Clyde status shit, and uh, you are essentially trapped in the dead of winter, uh, your cow's there at one point, but you then you can hear the clawing of the rats. You feel just the overwhelming guilt just building and building as you are trapped in this home. You think she is crawling out of the well and all of that craziness, and you are just, there's nowhere else to go, but just sit there and linger with, you know, every horrible aspect of what you've done and just, you know, just run it over in your mind and contemplate it and just turn it around and all this other stuff. Thomas Jane is fantastic in that Netflix adaptation. Uh, if I recall correctly, Mike Patton did the score for it, which is badass. It's, it's moody. It's creepy. It's, I mean, when the Stephen king Assance was initially transpiring in 2017, it, along with Gerald's Game, set the precedent for new, more just well-defined and serious as opposed to cheesy <laughs> Dark Tower, fuck you, um, Stephen King adaptations. That was really the only uh, exception to the rule that particular year. So 1922, great. Uh, and then a good marriage. Imagine being trapped in a home in a marriage with a serial killer. Somebody who is like, I'm trying to be better, hon, you know, and I never would have killed you because I love you, and you just happen to stumble upon, you know, IDs and all these different things of prior victims when you're going through, like, you know, a, a workspace at, at your home when your husband is out on business. That is a different kind of trap. That is a different kind of just craziness that, uh, yeah, I can't even fathom the... Yeah, the Joan Allen story, uh, and also the guy who played Joe <laughs> on Empire Records is her husband. That's funny now that I think about it. But uh, yeah, um, Anthony Pag Paglia, something there, yeah, yeah, whatever. Long story short, Good Marriage is a very trapped, confined, psyching sort of tale. And as we round out our last few, which are collected in The Bizarre of Bad Dreams, we have My Lady One, which is another one that I personally think is better than Christine, and in, in some ways, I feel like it's on par with uh, uh, From a Buick 8 that I sing so many praises upon, that it's an, uh, it's another like living entity slash car that you know just kills in nasty, gruesome fashion, and there's these couple kids that are like stowed away, trapped in this, like, uh, oh boy, it's like a rest stop that is beside where this car has been killing. It's really crazy, really cool, and they're trying to turn it into a feature film right now. Audiobook is very, very good for that one. It was originally, since it's a little longer, it's a novella. Um, it had its own, you know, just separate, but I, I really recommend just getting it in, uh, you know, the, the collected edition, so to speak. Get all those other short stories, which are really, really good. Uh, Afterlife, another one from Bizarre of Bad Dreams. And, you know, essentially you wake up in 
the afterlife and you're like walking through a lot of your transgressions and stuff like that and you are essentially given the option in this trap situation of either going back being reincarnated and restarting your life like just hit the reset button so to speak or in turn going forward it's uh it's a it's one of the better ones from bizarre bad dreams and really bizarre bad dreams as i have said quite a few times it's like kind of neck and neck with skeleton crew in my estimation for my third uh, as far as psyching collections of shorts go, but Afterlife is crazy. And then lastly, it's a story that I talked about when uh, we were doing none other than uh, the apocalyptic tales, and that is Summer Thunder. Summer Thunder is where you are confined to a world where the, the nuclear fallout is happening. The whole world has been ravaged and destroyed, and the last few people are trapped with nowhere to go as radiation poisoning is hitting everybody, slowly killing your dog, your only friend who was just down the way. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. And I, I guess from, uh, you know, even though I didn't write it on the list, you could probably talk about the little green god of agony as far as just the trapped aspect of having an evil presence within you after a uh, airplane accident that killed pretty much everybody else except for you, and you can't rehabilitate because this evil entity is trapped inside you and just hindering you from actually being able to get through. Can you tell that I've been stir crazy with all of the stuff that I just talked about, all of this analysis, all of these different things, everybody? The world is weird. It really is right now. But um, I am so supremely appreciative of all of you for tuning into this video. I have an in Fuego. Y'all can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. My YouTube for Infuegotainment has really been going off as of late. I've been putting up some retro reviews from the Phoenix Film Festival 2019 because unfortunately it's been postponed indefinitely. Uh, we were supposed to be covering it this weekend. Shed a tear. Shed a tear. And uh, yeah, but besides that, lots of Star Wars coverage as I vigilantly continue with and uh, you know, not to deter anything from our beloved horror show here, but uh, if you have any interest in checking out uh, some more stuff that I am going to be doing. But yeah, all the deets about that uh, will be coming here on April 1st when I launch my personal Patreon, but uh, you know, not to deter anything from the horror show here, obviously. And uh, if you haven't liked, shared, subscribed, I do this show every single Saturday. Next Saturday will be our next live event for the Hail to Stephen King Facebook group's Book of the Month, which is none other than on writing Stephen King's half autobiographical, half just just hand guide to trying to break back into writing yourself or, uh, you know, forge your way for the first time. It's a terrific read and, uh, yeah, it's been really awesome getting reacquainted with that here over the course of the month of March where we're obviously, <laughs> we are embroiled with lots of time to figure all of this out. And, uh, yes, uh, make sure to check out the Hails to Stephen King Facebook group where I'm the sole admin moderator. If you want to have some further palaver every Friday, we do Free God Fridays where you can talk about something besides Psy King. And uh, yeah, it's good to uh, kef and to, you know, palaver and camaraderie there. So I've been Fuego. Y'all have been awesome. And until the wheel of Ka comes around once more, I shall say hasta luego, sin amigos, and constant readers and viewers alike. But I am so very hopeful that we get to share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until then, stay scared and read Stephen King. Because you know you've got some time to do that shit right now. <laughs>